Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, I guess the first, first question is how, how, how do you find the, the conference so far? And, um, oh, the, count, the conference is exhilarating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's just amazing to see, especially what younger people are doing. It's, it's gratifying to see someone like Bill Brown talk about what he's learned in all these years and all these encounters. Uh, so that's, a, that's an incomparable data set and so forth. But I, I think, especially this one, the, seeing what the young people are doing is just mind-blowing. Mm. You know, it's just mind-blowing. And, and they're doing it, as Rulon so well summed up, by a combination of what we would call old-fashioned natural history and then st absolutely state-of-the-art genomics, uh, technology, citizen science, all that. So for me, I, I feel like, you know, it's like a glimmer of hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it, does it, do you feel that this conference is, is different from other kind of conferences that you attend? Uh, this, is, this is much smaller than most of the meetings I go to, so uh -huh. um, one reason I wanted to make sure I came to this one was because I had such a good time at the last one, yeah. which was very similar in a lot of ways to the way this one's run. Okay. I, think, I think probably Gordon Shewitt deserves a ton of the credit for subtle aspects of the way this is all arranged. Mm -hmm. um, so it's in a wonderful venue. So you step out the front door, you're driving to where you're sleeping at night. I mean, you can't but not be blown away by the scenery, right? Mm -hmm. It's also a classic herpetological locality. So, you know, there have been studies of the snakes. I don't know if you know about this, but there have been, starting in the early 60s, people who, in a very systematic way, did road driving on Portal Road and counted every snake and recorded where it was to a tenth of a mile. Mm -hmm. And then in the early 80s, somebody then, a pup named Joe Mendelson, who will be giving the after dinner talk, he redid it as, a stu as an undergraduate student. He redid that study and published it. And now that he has a study, who, he has a student who's accumulated all the museum collection records that relate to that road, all the field notes and all the previous publication data, and they're going to build it into a database and start looking at really long-term monitoring. Because it turns out over the last... That would be the last about 65 years, 75 years, there have been actual changes in the snake fauna of Portal Road, both in terms of absolute number of species, who's there and who's not, but also where they occur. So when I started working in Portal on blacktail rattlesnakes in 1985, western diamondbacks had not been seen in Portal. By the time I finished 20 years later, it started with us seeing a diamondback in the parking lot one day. Then we started seeing diamondbacks on the Paradise Road. By the time I finished my blacktail studies, diamondbacks were breeding three miles up into Paradise Canyon, into Silver Creek Canyon. Wow. So, you know, by having herpetologists come here over a period of almost a century, we've collectively demonstrated effects of land use, land use change, and so forth, vegetation change on snake distribution. Mm -hmm. So. You can't help but be inspired by the locality. Mm -hmm. and right. Bob and Sherry have put together this. Hello. I like dogs. Yeah, yeah. Hello. You know, they put together this incredible conference venue that's got state of the art, albeit the occasional power failure, state of the art uh, audiovisual, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then it's a pretty small number of people, all interested in the same thing. Pretty good spirit of not being too competitive with each other. Mm -hmm. and, and some people emphasize that, like Chris Parkinson mentioned in his talk that he, he liked to share data and share samples and see people being friendly, you know, even when they're working on the same project, potential competitors. Mm -hmm. so those are all reasons I think it's been a great meeting, um, as was the last one. Going off of your, your own personal relationship with this place, mm -hmm. given all this work you've done here looking at black tails, I, I had a question which was, um, what? It, it, talk about Superwoman 21. Oh, yeah. And kind of what yeah. impact yeah. she might have had on your life. Yeah, and yeah. You know, people are always asking me what's my favorite snake species. And uh, today I posted a whole bunch of, I just blasted Facebook with Happy Snake Day th uh, pictures huh. of, from my own experience over the last. So I have a giant python I saw in Africa. And I worked on Kalahari Cape Cobras a couple of years ago. And so I put a lot of pictures up. I, I'd have a hard time saying any one species of snake is my favorite now there'd be a handful that would be in the top, you know. Mm -hmm. But there, I think my favorite individual snake in my life is always going to be Super Female 21 because I watched her for 12 years. My, my late colleague and co-student of Blacktails was a Tucson physician named David Hardy. Mm -hmm. And we 
put radio transmitters and 50 blacktail rattlesnakes up in that canyon. Some of them we only saw a few times. Our, our best ever was Super Female 21 because we had 569 encounters with her in 12 years. We replaced her radio transmitter, I think, at least four times. In that period, and she was the first, she was the one with which we discovered parental care in pit vipers. Really? We, we started out studying these snakes up there because I was really interested in foraging ecology, so I wanted to watch snakes eat in the wild. Mm -hmm. But almost right away we discovered that we're seeing all this social behavior. So I don't remember the exact numbers, but of the total of 50 snakes in our study, less than half of them were found by us. More than half of them were found by other blacktails. Okay. So if you put a radio on a male blacktail, every summer when the monsoons begin, that male blacktail stops searching for food and for the next few weeks just spends his days and nights crawling these long straight lines, which it turns out is the optimal way to find a trail. Is to, mm. crawl, is to crawl a straight line. Wow. So meanwhile, the females are out there not crawling straight lines because they're hunting for food. Some of those females are going to be receptive this year and they smell like it, or rather they're leaving odor cues to the effect that they're... Some of those females are not because the females don't breed every year. Hmm. We never saw a male follow the trail of a female that in fact did not become mated that year and give birth the next year. So they mate in the late summer uh, store sperm over the winter, in, uh, fertilize in March, gestate till July and give birth. So it looks like almost a year from when they mate till they give birth. Okay, that's mm. the cycle. Mm. So if you put a radio on a male, come July, he's going to probably find at least one female and then you'll put a radio on her. If you've already got a radio on a female and that's her summer to be receptive, she will attract males. And then if your priority is to put more radios in males, you can do that. So at first we were kind of just putting radios on each snake we could get. And then one Sunday morning I was in Berkeley where I taught and worked there. And Dave called and he said, his voice was shaking. He said, you're not going to believe what I just saw. I said, tell me. He goes, well, female one gave birth a few days ago. So to back up slightly, when the females are pregnant, the year the female is pregnant, Unlike the other females, she doesn't disperse out into the lowlands and start hunting and eating. She stays relatively close to where she spent the winter. She finds a site, usually an abandoned rock squirrel burrow, and she gestates there from July. She, her home range from July to, uh, sorry, from March to July is about the size of this table. Hmm. She just doesn't move. Really? She just basks every day in a safe way, goes undercover at night. So we've been, that's, that's, so, you know, we're like, well, why not watch, you know? although we were studying foraging. So Dave goes out, checks her every day, and check, 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 and then all of a sudden, she's got babies. And then he comes back the next day, she's still with the babies. And, wow. and you know, the, our, our expectation, which was naive, and if we had critically evaluated the literature, which we later did, we would realize that herpetologists, including me, had been seeing this for years and not realizing it. Mm -hmm. So what he told me on the phone is, you're just not going to believe this. She stayed with her babies for like nine days. Every day she'd come out in the sun basking with them. If Dave got too close, she would rattle and back in. They would run into the hole and she'd back in after him, facing him. And then on like the 10th day, he goes out there. There's nothing but little tiny mollusca sheds, little blacktail sheds. And female 21 is like 40 yards away at a wood rat nest trying to catch her first meal in 11 months. Mind-blowing, you know? Yeah. So that was like, we're, we're like, oh my God, you know? She, she, she's, she's taking care of her babies. Mm. So then, after that, we just stopped putting transmitters in, in, in males. We, we just, we were free to do this, so we just shifted our emphasis to try and study parental care. And after that, we were just putting radios in females. And I don't remember the exact number, but we managed to limit her six or eight pregnant females and followed them through one or more, in the case of Super Female 21, four pregnancies. Wow. So over a 12 year period, we watched her. We watched her mate many, multiple times. We watched her hunt. We watched her crawl with big swollen food boluses. And four times, we watched her through gestation, to birth, to postnatal attendance, to then splitting up from her babies. Wow. And so uh, in 2004, we published a big book chapter uh, 
with various collaborators, including Terry Farrell, the guy that gave the talk the first day on pygmy rattlesnakes. While we were writing this chapter on, on parental care, they, the core of the chapter was our field studies, but we had pulled in literature records and doing a little phylogenetic survey of how it could have evolved. We found out about Terry's work, and he had done some extremely cool lab experiments, which he could do because pygmies are so small. Mm -hmm. And so we, we contacted him, asked him if he wanted to be part of this this bigger paper because if he came in with it, it would be an even more comprehensive put parental care and vipers on the map and pit vipers on the map. So he did. And so um, we, we published this long book chapter on parental care and, and pit vipers. Hmm. So that. So you really get. Was at the, I called her that because we numbered them all, but I, I became extremely fond of her. A, a really interesting thing that happened was. Uh, when David Hardy and I start, first started working together in 1985, I was still doing picking up venomous snakes by manual restraint, which was the old way where you mash their head down and yeah. pick them up. And actually, uh, the younger you are, the more likely you are to find the nearest attractive woman and take the pencil out and show her the fangs. And the point is, oh, I'm I'm such a stud, you know. I'm so brave right. that I pick up this incredibly dangerous animal. And, about the time I met Dave Hardy, I was still doing that, and I had already started doing telemetry. And Dave convinced me that uh, it was it was completely unnecessary because we could use tubes and anesthesia to to handle the snakes. Mm. And second, you know, it, it was traumatic to the snakes. Yeah. And especially once I recognized that it was it was traumatic to them. And here I was trying to study behavior, and the first thing we learned from me was I was doing this incredibly mean thing to him. It's just stupid, right? Right. So right, right about right when we started the blacktail study in 1985, we had stopped manually straining snakes. Fortunately, so none of our snakes was ever pinned down and picked up by the head and all that. We 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 were at pains actually to very gently. We find a blacktail, we have a bucket or a net bag, and then we as gently as possible with hooks. You know, get them in there. We, and we, we like we just bend over backwards to not disturb them. Often we wouldn't hear them rattle. Mm -hmm. Bring them back to our little lab at his summer home there in Cave Creek, and then we would tube them and anesthetize them with a gas anesthetic. While they were anesthetized, we surgically implant the radio, measure them, weigh them, probe them, all this stuff, and they would wake up going kind of, huh? Oh, what happened to the last 20 minutes? Mm -hmm. And then we would put them right back out there, and then we always approach quietly and. You know, we try to spot them with binos before we got closer. The point being that Super Female 21 was never traumatized. Right, right. I don't think I ever heard Female 21 rattle during wow. the entire time I knew that snake. And most interestingly, one time I was trying to locate her and I got her signal. Have you, have you ever been around anybody using telemetry? I have, yeah. You know what it's yes, like. Yes, yeah, It's sure. hot and cold with the string, yep. signal string. As you get closer, you keep turning down the gain so the volume goes down, Yep. blah, blah, blah. So, so I'm doing that. I happen to be by myself. And I've localized her signal to this juniper tree that happened to have some space under it. I can see, and there's no rattlesnake. So I made the stupid mistake of presuming she must be under the duff. Mm -hmm. I had absolutely no basis for thinking that. Mm -hmm. I've never before or since seen a blacktail rattlesnake buried in litter, but somehow I thought that was possible. Uh -huh. So I walked around several times and I couldn't get any more directionality. I was so close, I was just getting... Yep. So I took the antenna off the cable and I used the cable as a real short distance antenna. I got it on my hands and knees and I crawled around a couple of times around the tree, you know, touch probing. And I couldn't, I couldn't localize that snake. So I, I was, I was well under the juniper, and I put down the cable, and I just sort of sat up. But I'm down on my butt, you know. And I was actually remembering Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, mm -hmm. which is a book you may have read. Sure, sure. And I was remembering in there the idea of gumption traps, which is where you're, you've got some preconception, and it keeps you. From it blocks you from finding out the truth. You know? mm. So you, you can't find out the nice. truth until you get rid of your gumption yeah, trap. Yeah. I was actually daydreaming. Kind of, I was having <laughs> a big WTF moment, you know? Yeah. And I turned my head slightly to the right, and I realized female 21 was inches from my face, about two feet off the ground on a limb of that juniper. And she had never so much as ch -ch 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 her rattle. She, I don't think she had even flicked her tongue. Uh, she had, she had, uh, to, as far as I know, she had not moved. 
my face was literally within inches of the of the head facing me of this black tail rattlesnake. Hmm. And of course that was a little bit thought provoking, you know. Right. And so I I thought and it turned out to be fine and I just sort of slipped a, a, away. Wow. In a, sort of a direct line. I just without moving fast, I just so what did you see? Did you see her out of the corner of your eye? Kind yeah, of thing? I saw her out of the corner of my eye. And, and I slipped out from her wow. and left her alone, you know. She never bit me. Now, I'm not going to do the experiment. I have no way to prove this. It's certainly plausible that had she been manually restrained two or three times by a human being, yep. I could have got bit. Sure. I could, have, I could have trained that snake to be defensive around something that looked both heat signature wise and visually and chemosensorily like me. Wow. And I didn't get that. Wow. Yeah. That's cool, huh? that's that's absolutely incredible. And I mean and you said tw it's 12 years. Yeah, we watched her for 12 years. So I mean I guess my I, to ask my next question is I mean what did she teach you about snake time? This I, I don't know if you coined that term or if uh, that, Chuck Bowden or did he did he coin yeah, it? Okay. Chuck, Chuck Bowden wrote about snake time because he Chuck had already had encounters with a diamondback uh -huh. And a little casita he stayed in over in southwestern Arizona, southwest of Tucson, I don't uh -huh. know exactly where. But he wrote about, the, he named this diamondback, I can't remember what. And this diamondback would show up on his patio. Right. And right where, right where he would sit his chair in the afternoon and have a drink or something. Mm -hmm. And so Chuck had written about that snake, and I think it was in that essay that he, he talked about snake time, you know. And then when he and I became friends, he would ask me stuff, you know. And he, he, would, he was friends of the Hardys, too, and so he would come down to here and... And at some point, I said to him, "You know, Chuck, if you if you want to really understand snake time, you got to you got to get out on your belly." Mm. He goes, "I'm I'm 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 in," you know. And so, a time came at which Chuck was out with me, and there was a male blacktail courting a female blacktail, kind of up against a little ledge, and we just laid down mm. on our bellies, you know, on our, on our bellies and elbows, me taking pictures and Chuck writing notes, and he published that later in Wild Earth magazine. Right. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, isn't that cool. It's so it's so yeah. awesome. I, yeah. I guess my my next question is, um, what other I mean, what other either encounters with specific organisms or just experiences gen in general do you think had the you know formidable influence on your your path? You know, the your life, your career, how you look at things. Um, so, one thing, I'll, I guess I'll tell you two things, and one reaches way back and one is pretty recent. Okay, good. That was I was going to ask for an early one and maybe yeah. a more recent. So, the earlier one is that um, I was a really nerdy teenager, and I had the chance to go to the University of Kansas to a summer camp when I was still in high school, and I worked for Henry Fitch, mm. the guy that was talked about earlier. Yep. And so, I started publishing when I was a teenager. So, the time I went off to college, I was a really nerdy teenager who had already, publ already published three papers and hardly ever had a date. And I also had never drank a beer, I, I, you know. So I, I, was, I was really socially retarded. And I went off to college away from my military, fairly 